Hi, everybody. Peter Greenberg here. Welcome to our weekly global travel update uh, coming into April. Of course, uh, this is the last day of March. Hard to believe it's already the beginning of the second quarter. Of course, you know how to reach me with all of your comments and questions, so please start doing that. But in the meantime, let's catch up on what I'm doing. First of all, I send you greetings from the Ritz-Carlton here in Dallas, Texas. No, I am not here for the Taylor Swift concert where the, where the cheap tickets are going for about 600 bucks a pop. Uh, of course, there are a lot of people who are here for that, not to mention the Final Four in, uh, in women's college basketball as well. But what we are here for is to give you the global travel update, and there's a lot of it. Still fallout for the banking failures and demand being hit, which means watch your, uh, watch your internet research carefully. You might find some airfare deals and some frequent flyer award seats starting to come due. Availability is, you know, hasn't been around. It's starting to show up, which is great. Uh, and that's an important thing. However, there are certain airlines that are still uh, abusing the frequent flyer award privilege in terms of how they're rating and valuing those miles. Uh, can you, would you believe that Delta Airlines was actually, you heard my story a couple weeks ago that they wanted 749,000 miles to redeem for one business class ticket between Atlanta and Santiago. How about this one? They wanted for a one-way economy ticket between Dallas, where I am right now, and Bangkok, $505,000. Stop it. It's ridiculous. Uh, all right. Now, certain things also haven't changed. Airlines are still publishing schedules that they can never possibly execute. They're publishing schedules with the connect times that you could never possibly execute. I was uh, I looked at a flight the other day with a 33-minute connect time in Miami. Have they been to Miami? You can't, first of all, you can't get off the plane in 33 minutes. I was in Miami the other night on a flight from Cartagena to Miami. It took 35 minutes to get off the plane let alone make a connecting time. Crazy times. We, look, I'm not one of those people who say we need re-regulation and the government needs to step in, but somebody needs to step in. If the airlines won't practice common sense, then we have to legislate it. You can't publish schedules with 33-minute connect times. It's cruel and unusual punishment, and it leads to cruel and unusual, you know, basically detention because you're not going to leave the airport if you're making that connecting flight. I mean, please, you know, it, it leads me to believe the people who build airports have never flown, the people who run airlines have never scheduled, and we, we can go on and on. But after a certain amount of time, you would think somebody would wake up and realize this is also costing the airlines money in fuel burn, in flight crew time or time out, and not to mention passenger, you know, disadvantage. Gee, what a concept. All right. Uh, speaking of schedule... We're seeing airlines like JetBlue making an announcement. What, what's their announcement? They're going to start cutting flights on their summer schedule. Why would you ever do that in the summer? Well, it's not because they want to. It's because they're confronting, as all airlines are confronting, we just saw JetBlue react before anybody else, to guess what? A staffing shortage at air traffic control centers. Again, it gets back to schedule. If you don't have, if you, first of all, if you publish an unrealistic schedule, that's crazy. If you don't have enough air traffic controllers, you can't operate the flights within the time period that they give you. Which brings me up to another thing. Runway scheduling. How are airlines allowed to announce 34 airport departures from one airport at 8 o'clock in the morning? Now, let's do the math. In the best of times, with 20-20 with visibility on a beautiful day, with no temperature limiting uh, you know, height or limiting lift, the most a, an airport runway can accommodate is 23 departures an hour, right? It, it takes you so much time to get to the runway. You have to watch the other plane take off. It takes you about two and a half minutes to spool up. So multiply that by 23, you're at 60. That's it, done. So 23 departures in an hour. Why are airlines allowed to schedule 34? All leaving at eight o'clock. Yeah, are they being competitive in schedule? Yes. Are they being cruel and unusual to you? Yes, because that's punishment. They can't, they physically can't do it. My suggestion is that somebody, maybe the FAA, does per airport, per runway, a, a, a lottery. So that, for example, uh, Delta Airlines gets an 803 departure time and United gets an 807. 
and American gets an 811 and so on. And in the next hour, it reverses and Frontier gets the 803 and Spirit, whatever it is. And if you miss that time slot, you go to a penalty. Then you'll start seeing airlines schedule departures at 803 or 807. I mean, the point is, it's more realistic and it gets down to 23 per hour. Stop trying to compete where you can't deliver. Sooner or later, it bites you in the you know what. And it's been doing that for quite some time. We're just seeing more of it now because people are reporting it more. All right. I don't give enough uh, uh, subject time to trains. I'm a big train fan. I hope you are too. But I want to show you where we're falling apart. We don't have high, we don't have high speed trains in America. In fact, what did we learn after the recent derailment in Ohio? How many trains derail a year in the United States? Over a thousand. We just don't hear about it a lot, unless there's an explosion, fire, and death, and of course, toxicity. Uh, we don't have good tracks. We have no high speed rail to speak of, and yet we have the, the you know, we have the geography to do it. We have the technology to do it. We need the freight train lines to come aboard. They own the tracks. They don't care about high speed. We do. And let's fix the system. I'm going to show you a map from 2008 in China to show you their rail network, their high speed rail network. And then I'm going to show you a map from last week. And you tell me if you think the Chinese are ahead of us in train technology and implementation of that technology. Go to the map. Look at 2008 and look at 2020. That's the rail network in China. What does that tell you? How smart are they? Why can't we at least take the existing track network we have and improve the condition of the tracks so it will support high-speed rail? This is nuts. Okay, get rid of the track photo because it bothers me. <laughs> it does. It's embarrassing. Okay, let's go ahead quickly and say hello to a couple of people before we get to more stuff. All right. All right, Teddy's saying hi from LA. Paul's saying uh, greetings from Ashland, Virginia, home of Secretariat. Oh my God, this is the 50th, are you serious? This is the 50th anniversary of his Triple Crown win? I actually remember when we put Secretariat on the cover of Newsweek. Oh my God. Speaking of anniversaries, I'm coming to you from Dallas. Okay, everybody, wanna feel really old? This November, the 60th anniversary of the assassination right here in Dallas of JFK. Where were you, even if you were even alive, on November 22nd, 1963? Wow, wow, wow. Lorene's saying hi for Lorene is saying hi from Lansing. And uh, all right, we got some Tanzania friends watching. Evelyn's saying hi from Denver. Uh, Catherine says, my husband and I will be taking a cruise in November and we will be will be uh, stopping in Buenos Aires. And, oh, excuse me, in, in Bali. Nice. Uh, the ship's excursions are very expensive. So we'll be booking with a third-party company. Do we need a visa if we are going off on our own? No, you don't. It's handled by the ship. However, let me tell you another option, not just for Bali, but for anywhere else you might be going. Uh, I always call ahead to the best hotel in town, and I talk to the concierge. I try to make friends with at least one other couple on the ship. And then I say, hey, can we book a limo and a driver and a guide, and we go off and do what we want? We, we see what we want. We're not stuck at a gift shop buying tchotchkes we don't need or watching a very touristic dance marathon. And we have a much better time in the limited amount of time we have in a port. You might want to consider that as well. Uh, hi from Bellingham, Washington. And Robin says hi from Williamsburg. Nice to see you again, Robin. Uh, Sid says, lost my taste for loyalty to one airline because I found... Uh, I found their program was essentially worthless shopping around from now on. Well, let me tell you my worthless experience. It doesn't matter how many miles I have. It doesn't matter how many miles I want to brag to you that I have. If I can't redeem them, why did I join the program? To be rewarded for my loyalty. Now, did I join the program to buy a toaster or subscribe to a magazine? No, I joined the program to be rewarded for my loyalty with tickets I could then use meaningfully to go to destinations of my choice on my time. We all know how many unredeemed frequent flyer miles there are out there right now. It's 34 trillion, which would give you an idea of A, how popular programs are and how useless they become. Uh, 
During the, the, the period before the pandemic in 2019, uh, on Delta alone, I had amassed so many upgrade certificates, domestic or global. I had amassed so many um, companion tickets or flight credit vouchers. Well, I couldn't use them in 2020 for all the obvious reasons. And in 21 and 2022, as travel came roaring back, they weren't available. All the planes were full. So what did Delta do two months ago? They expired them all. And I called Delta and I said, tell me something. What's the point of a frequent flyer program that doesn't reward you for your loyalty? You're giving me the draconian gift card that doesn't that I can't use. So why would you like just cancel them? Why don't you just continue my delusion into thinking they might be able to be used in 2023 when, of course, we all know we can't? Why would you just outright cancel them? And you know what they told me? Because we can. And they can. And they did. So when you get these, anytime an airline gives you an opportunity of either extra mileage when they delay your flight or a voucher when they cancel your flight or a free companion certificate if you reach a certain mileage level, try to laugh because you're not going to be able to use them. At a certain point, just like airline scheduling, we need some authority, somebody in a regulatory manner, right, to fix this. The reason why we have speed limits on the freeways is because when you travel beyond that, you have an accident. Well, we don't have any limits right now on the way that these, man these programs are managed by the airlines. And I think with 34 trillion unredeemed miles out there, we've had an accident. We got to get back on track. All right. That's my lecture for today on frequent flyer miles. Uh, Carmen saying hi from Tampa. Hello from New Jersey to Gail. Ah, more friends in Tanzania. Hello, Lukande. Um, all right, moving on. Ah, Camilla saying hi from Tucson. Uh, Colleen wants to know, did I hear about this issue at SFO on Tuesday? A plane descended below the glide path and caused the tail to be snapped off the plane upon landing. Are you serious? Uh, I didn't see the news coverage on this. I will check into it. You know, you lose the tail on a triple seven. Uh, that's something. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're going back to the incident in uh, San Francisco with Aziana, where he he descended below the glide path and d literally broke up. I, I covered that story. But you're telling me something else happened again? Let me know more. Hello, Catherine from San Diego. Uh, all right. Amanda in Miami. Any news about the opening of the gem in Egypt? No. They still can't get their act together. Listen, the pharaohs move faster. I don't know why they're waiting. It's essentially open and operational, but they will not open it to the public yet. I don't know what they're waiting for. This is getting to be an embarrassment. As soon as I can find out more, I will. Uh, okay, Tim says I have, uh, he's from Atlanta, a two-part insurance question. What were the names of those health travel insurance companies you mentioned before? Oh, I will tell you. One is called... Travel Guard, and one is called um, Allianz for that's trip cancellation and interruption insurance. And for medical evacuation insurance, that's medical evacuation and repatriation insurance. That's trip, uh, excuse me, that's um, what am I thinking about? Oh, MedJet Assist and uh, Travel Guard as well. But even though I mentioned those names, you still owe it to yourself to read the fine print to make sure there are no exclusions for pre existing conditions. Or, or your age condition, or basically your age, or even some uh, some restrictions on locations you might be traveling to. Read the fine print. All right. Hello, hello, Debbie from Boynton Beach. Hello, Tammy from uh, San Diego. Newport Beach, Craig's weighing in. Uh, ah, Evelyn wants to know, was I filming in Cartagena? Uh, we, we did our radio show from there, and I was also there to give a speech uh, at the big uh, hotel investment uh, summit. And, uh, and we did a small little video from there as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Joan is saying hi from finally a sunny San Jose. Uh, Iris, hello from Queens. Ah, hello, Iris. I just saw you yesterday in New York. Uh, Patty Porter, hello from Kentucky, uh, where, I, where I saw Secretariat win. Wow. And then, you, and then you welcomed him when he retired. Yep. Okay. Uh, Okay, well, happy 44, oh, excuse me, happy 46th uh, wedding anniversary to Gail. 
Uh, okay. Paul says the U.S. missed the boat in the 1950s when the interstate highway system was started. High-speed rail could have been built right alongside the roadway. Yeah, listen, we missed the boat a lot of times. Sometimes we weren't allowed to see the boat. How about Los Angeles, which used to have the old red cars and had a great mass transportation system until the gas companies and the tire companies conspired to make us live in our cars on the 405. Remember that? Uh, okay, Joy says, I'm flying to California September 26th to October 4th for a cruise. When should we book our airfare? Well, right now, it's a little too soon. It's actually way too soon. Uh, I would say right after, or maybe even right before Labor Day is when you want to do that, okay? Uh, April saying, greetings from Las Vegas. And she's going to Egypt in November, okay. Uh, Peggy saying, hello from El Dorado. Oh, El, well, is it El Dorado or El Dorado, Arkansas, right? By the way, there's also Texarkana, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas, too. Uh, okay, here we go. What do we have here? Debbie's saying, I use my rewards for travel on my visa for cash in my bank account. I have no idea what you're talking about. Let me know. Um, all right. Colleen says, thanks to your brilliant advice. Well, thank you, Colleen. Uh, I use 60,000 United points to book a four four trip nonstop San Francisco Frankfurt for oh wow pretty cool that's a pretty that's a very good mileage redemption number uh okay Harriet and I visited Beijing five years ago it's amazing how many people uh they move by train it's true uh all right Teddy says can I recommend a small ship cruise that travels around the Canary Islands uh <laughs> she says the, the Ritz in, in Dallas has the best scones with lemon curd. I'll check that out for you. Uh, you know what? You write me, Teddy, Peter, PeterGreenberg.com, and we'll get you that answer on the Canary Islands, okay? Uh, right. The Asiana flight was in 2013. By the way, in 2020 visibility, and that was an interesting story because you had three pilots in the cockpit, one of whom was actually a Czech pilot, and the instrument landing system wasn't working at San Francisco that day. But you didn't need it. It was 2020 visibility. And guess what? These pilots were so used to basically monitoring systems, they literally forgot how to fly the plane and they came in too low. You know, that's a big problem these days. Technology is not always the answer. When in doubt, you better know how to fly the plane. That's why you were hired. Uh, okay. Hello from Atchison, Kansas. Uh, ah. Mike is saying, stuck in Salt Lake City for 24 hours now for AA mechanical issue. Woo, okay. Uh, oh, <laughs> what do I think of America West executives running AA? Well, it's AA, it's America West executives, which then morphed into what? US Airways executives. Uh, I have some issues with that, right? If you talk to somebody who's mainline American, versus someone who was mainline uh, U.S. Air who now works for American, you might find some agreement thinking that they really liked American management better. Uh, but that's an entirely different show we'll do at another time. Uh, Tim says, how do travel agencies make money? Do they make it from the booker, the person booking the, uh, the flights, or from the airlines? Well, in the old days, travel agencies were basically set up as a welfare state by the airlines. The airlines provided them their computer systems, which were biased. They gave them no benefits. They gave them not really much perks except some discounted flights. And then they were required, if they wanted to keep those systems, to book that particular airline through that computer system. And they made their commission. And there were some overrides on commissions for volume producers. Uh, but then, of course, back in the, uh, I even forget when Ron Allen did it at Delta, but he canceled commissions at airlines and put in commission caps from Delta. And that changed the dynamic of pricing and how many travel agents could stay in business. And the really good travel agents who knew what they were talking about or could specialize in a particular affinity or a destination or a region, then they could actually charge service fees to the customer for providing that kind of service. So it's a mix of both these days. Uh, okay. Ah, Lorena says, I saw Biscoffs today that are covered with chocolate. Well, my favorite cookie on the airplane, of course, is Biscoffs. How are the Biscoffs truck covered with chocolate? 
I want to know more. Okay. Uh, ah, Debbie saying the bright line uh, fast train to Miami, to Miami to Palm Beach. I'm taking it. And you know they're about to open up in Orlando now. So that's a good train. I I love that train. Uh, and it gets people off the freeway. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, okay, Rich is a college student with limited funds. Is now the time to buy plane tickets and book Hotel to Europe? Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, today would be a good day because we're seeing a huge battle over the North Atlantic uh, from all the airlines, including... Uh, one that's in relatively new called Norse Atlantic. They've got an airfare sale that expires on April 6th, but it's good for the summer. As fares as low as get ready $139 each way from the U.S. to London. Get that now. Uh, okay. Oh, now Debbie's explained herself. I use travel rewards with Visa. They give 5% in cash back. You know what? You're going to see more and more people go to those cash back credit cards because at least it's tangible. You're getting something back. Okay? Think about that. How do you value your, your mileage? If the airlines aren't valuing it, then why are you joining the programs? Okay. Okay. And thank you, Peggy, for telling me the correct pronunciation. El Dorado. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I love this question from Hakeem. How is American Airlines able to put 172 seats on a 737-800 with a very large spatula? Look, this is crazy. It's not a new subject for me. It gets me angry. We're not talking about comfort here. We, we can, but we're talking about safety. How do you safely evacuate? 172 people crammed into a 737 with their requisite amount of carry-on bags and everything else. If half the exits are blocked and it's in the dark and the plane's on fire, how do you do that in less than 90 seconds? Well, that's what the that's what airlines are supposed to be able to comply with from the FAA. And guess what? They pass it every time. My argument has always been they must be hiring the cast from Cirque du Soleil. I was on a 737 last night from LaGuardia to Dallas. It took me 32 minutes to get off the plane. And it was a very full flight. Everybody had their luggage. Everything is crammed in the aisle. You can't do it. Uh, but they're able to do it because they can, because the FAA needs to redo those tests and to change the criteria for those tests to put in a cross-section of age, infirmity or phys physical disability, Lots of carry-on bags, screaming kids, <coughs> you name it. And then let's see if they pass the test. And then let's see if they can configure the plane to realistically reflect your ability to get out of it. Now, of course, there's the other argument that the minute they do that, airfares go up. I get it. But I'd much rather spend $10 more per seat and live. Just a thought. Okay, here we go. Uh Okay, here we go. Keep going. Pat's saying, to avoid disappointment, I use my miles to fly relatives and friends. Hey, listen, if you can get the miles redeemed and fly them, go for it. I know there used to be an opportunity in the, in the old days where you could actually put your miles in your will and basically will them to somebody else. And I used to like to laugh saying, instead of dying trying in your lifetime, give it to somebody else. Let them try you know, doing it by dying. I mean, it, it, it doesn't happen anymore. The airlines have changed the rules. You can't put, you can't will it to anybody. So there's no reason to hold on to them. If you can get rid of them to your friends and relatives, do it. If you can redeem them, anytime you wait to do it, the the miles become less valuable by the day. Uh, okay, uh, Joy, I'm going to Jamaica June 5th. When should we book airfare now? Okay. Going to the big island in Hawaii, Sue is. October 1st, when should I get airfare? Not now. Do it sometime at the end of July, early uh, early August, okay? Uh, okay. Oh, now I'm getting the report on the Biscoffs. The package looked like the bottoms are dunked in chocolate. Save me some. That's the Biscoffs, okay. Uh, and, and Tammy's going... How about last discount minute flights to Europe for early April? Well, 
you're in a gray area there. You're in a shoulder period. You might have some last minute discounts or you may be able to use your mileage then. Remember, that's going to open up. It may close by June, but April, that's next month. That's tomorrow. It might happen. Uh, Tim says, so why is it so hard to get some kind of real airfare airline reform? And will we ever see some of that, some of that reform? The answer is not going to be in legislation because that's not going to pass either house, but it will be in the form of rulemaking changes that comes from the DOT. We just have to make sure they actually become proactive and consumer friendly. And the same thing happens with the FAA, an agency need in desperate, desperate need of a revamp and rule, rule changes there as well. Uh, all right. Uh, here we go. I'm now going to change, change gears here before I go to, uh, any more questions here? Let me do this here. Hold on a second. Oh, we got tons of people on this one too. Hold on. Greetings from Rwanda. All right. Hello, Peter, my good friend, who was driving us around when we did Royal Tour of Rwanda with the President Paul Kagame. Uh, okay. Why is the Amtrak Talgo train set being retired? I don't know. Uh, okay. Will Amtrak restore... Las Vegas to LA service. You know, they've tried to do that service, I think six times in my lifetime already, and it always fails. And, and the reason I think it does is for whatever reason, people like driving to, to Vegas. It's sort of like the Thelma and Louise moment to get to the casinos. Uh, they just are not getting the loads they wanted on the trains. I hope they come back. Uh, okay. Uh, lots of folks here from Tanzania. Okay. Uh, okay. Boy, all the folks. Very good. Wow, I'm just going through everybody here. We've got Victorville, California. Bend, Oregon. Uh, more Tanzania. Greetings from North Carolina. Uh, first trip to Ireland in May. Any tips? What a self-serving question. Go to, our, go to PBS or go to Amazon Prime or Apple TV Plus. See our new one-hour special which just premiered two weeks ago today on, uh, on St. Patrick's Day, as a matter of fact. It's called Hidden Ireland. And by the way, we have another special coming up uh, next month. It premieres starting, I think, after April 8th. So check your local listings for PBS. It'll also be streaming on Amazon Prime and Apple TV Plus in perfect time for the summer. We'll give you a little trailer right now. It's the Hidden Aegean. It is known for one of the best preserved Roman ruins in the world. But this isn't Italy. It's steeped in Greek mythology, a place where Homer's epics come to life. But it's not Greece. It is where a succession of historic empires have left their mark. And pagan, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish cultures have collided and coexisting. A sprawling coastline of incredible beauty with stunning landscapes, endless beaches, and clear turquoise waters that have been traversed for millennia, yet are still waiting to be discovered and ponder the future. I'm Peter Greenberg, and this is Turkey's Hidden Aegean. And there you have it, another one of our specials in our hidden series on PBS, Amazon Prime, and Apple TV+. Plus. You know, I'm coming to you from the Ritz-Carlton here in Dallas. A lot of people are asking me, you know, what should you always do before you ever check into a hotel? And one of my advices is, one of my pieces of advice is, three words you want to remember. Ice machine, elevator, and ballroom. Why those three words? Well, Ice machine and elevator you don't want to be close to, and ballroom you don't want to be over, right? The ice machine is a noise generator, so stay away from that. The elevators, you want to be at least five or six rooms down the hall from it because, remember, elevators announce their arrival, and you're going to be waking, you know, it's, it's terrible, right? Boom, 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 bing, 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 who cares? But the speaking of boom, 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 and bing, 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 how about... Two o'clock in the morning and the sound of broken glass. That's what happens if you're over the ballroom, because that's when the Schmidlap wedding's clearing out 
and they're throwing out all those champagne and wine bottles at the sound of breaking glass as the garbage trucks move in. So before you ever get your room key, just ask them, how close am I to the ice machine? How close am I to the elevators? And how far up above the ballroom am I? And try not to do that. That's number one. And of course, my other piece of advice is always ask where the booster pumps are. The booster pumps, that's right. No hotel can maintain adequately strong water pressure on all their floors. And so on different floors, not alternating floors, but on different floors, they'll put in booster pumps. So you ask that question at the front desk saying, hey, could you check with your engineer and find out what floor the booster pumps are on? They'll look at you for 10 seconds with deer in the headlights looks. And then they'll tell you, oh, we have one on the fourth floor, the one on the eighth floor, one on the 11th floor. And you say, I'll take a room on that floor. Because when you get that key to that room on that floor and you walk in, and you go to the bathroom and you go into the shower and you turn on the faucet, it's a fire hose. You get the pressure you want. Just a little tip here from a hotel in Dallas. And by the way, that's applicable at all high rise hotels, whether they want to tell you that or not. Hey, let's. I asked you guys a question this week and boy, did we get answers. What was your most memorable travel experience? Listen to some of these. Uh, uh, this is from Bob. Friday night choral evening song in Westminster Cathedral. Dalton says the most memorable was the eruption of the of the volcano in ice in Iceland the day we were scheduled to fly to Amsterdam. I, I I was there. I remember that. I covered that story. Amir says the wolf watching at sunrise in Yellowstone in the winter or sunset golden hour of the old city of Jerusalem. I concur. Uh, Cindy says, and I know Cindy. Horseback riding in Mongolia. You survived that, huh? Okay, keep on going here. Uh, this one I love. This is from Scott. He says, the date was July 9th, 2006. I was staying with my family at the Beach Club at Disney before heading out on a cruise. Italy had just won the World Cup in Germany a few hours before. I was able to snag a reservation at Alfredo's restaurant at Epcot. We walked over and checked in. And as he basically says to us, uh, they made their choices on the appetizer. As the waiter was clearing our entree plates, the accordion player arrived because he had asked to sing. Scott wanted to sing. And the, and the accordion player grunted that the waiter had indicated I wanted to sing. Yes, I do, I replied. He asked what? And I said, in honor of the big win, I, want, I wanted to sing Nessun Dorma. We know that song. He grunted, what key? I told the original key, of course. He grunted again and began to play. And uh, I began to sing. During the interlude before the big finish, I stood up at the request of some of the other diners. I did the big finish, and the place erupted in bedlam. Napkins waving, people standing, cameras flashing. It was insane. The accordion player grabbed me with, with his meaty hand. <laughs> I love this description. And said, that was great. Within minutes, the general manager came over and said, I apologize to you. Many people claim they can sing, but you were the first who could. <laughs> and by the way, the meal and the tip is on the house. All right. A lot of you loved snorkeling or swimming with either uh, whale sharks or, or hammerhead sharks, uh, but not really hammerheads. You really want the whale sharks. Uh, that was good. Uh, some of you, uh, Vivian, my good friend Vivian Duchelle here in Dallas. She, uh, we were we were in Shanghai. We took a morning stroll through the lovely park, already crowded with local residents. We loved their caged birds warbling in the trees while their owners were practicing tai chi. The most memorable stop in the park was listening to an enthusiastic choir. We clapped and the choir director said in halting English, can we play a song for you American friends? Of course we said yes. They thumbed through their songbooks and then went through the Red River Valley. A moment in Sino-American diplomacy we never forgot. I love spontaneous moments like this. Now here's one from Matthew who says, the tour conducted by the National Park Service at the Gettysburg National Cemetery, a tour which every American should be compelled to take, my wife and I happened upon it only because we were passing through the area to another destination. What all of these moments are telling me, with the exception of a couple of them, is that some of the best moments, some of the most memorable moments you've had is when you didn't plan anything. It just happened. You were strolling down the street and you turned left instead of turning right and ended up meeting a lifelong friend. Or you ended up going up instead of down and met someone you never otherwise would have met. Or... You decided to spontaneously sing at a, at a restaurant at Disney World. And next thing you know, free meal. Uh, so thanks for sending those in. Those are really, really great. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about today before I go to, to more of your questions. 
We all remember during the pandemic when United Airlines made the first move to cancel those draconian change fees. And look, we understand why they canceled them then because nobody was flying anyway, but it was a great idea. Other airlines followed suit. Southwest Airlines already had no change fees, so that was great. But now something else has come up and they're not calling it change fees. It's calling difference in fares. So for example, if I want to cancel something and then I want to take another flight and that fare is higher, I have to pay the difference, right? Sometimes the real problem happens is if I'm on a, on a ticket with two or three flights, right? A primary flight, a connecting flight, or a return flight, or a multi-city flight. And if you cancel one of those, the ticket goes out the window and you're paying a huge premium to rebook everything, even though you only wanted to change one flight. So here's what I do now. I book individual one-way tickets on different airlines when they have competing routes, right? So that if I, have to, if I have to cancel one leg, I'm only canceling that one leg and paying a fare difference if there is one. In some cases, nicely enough, the fare on that leg has gone down and you get to keep the difference. So I know it's more convenient to book everything on one ticket on one record locator, but the danger is if you have to cancel it, you know what happens, you have to pay the price. And that's not really good. Uh, one other little thing that should make you happy uh, it'll happen next year. You know, what are the Brits doing that we're not doing well or fast enough? They figured out new technology so that by June of 2024, we won't have our liquids banned at security checkpoints. That's right. In the United Kingdom, before June of 2024, they've come up, they've gotten rid of the 2D technology, they've got more advanced scanners that can be much more sophisticated in terms of what they can detect. And the old 311 rule, at least if you're flying from the United Kingdom, will be gone. That means all your lotions, your potions, uh, everything you want to fly with, right? Even your duty-free liquor that you buy, anything you get to bring on through the security checkpoints. Of course, the TSA tells me they're working on similar technology. They've ordered the, they've ordered the machinery, but there's no date yet from the TSA as to when they're going to implement it. And of course, then there's that period of time where they have to train all the agents in how to use it. But the good news is the Brits are leading the way, at least. And if you're coming from the UK, that's great. If then you're connecting in the United States and you have to go through security, now you have another problem because you can't do it. And then adding confusion to everything, what happened earlier this week? The TSA has now determined that peanut butter is a liquid. You heard me. So that PBJ ain't going to get through the security checkpoints. So that raises the question, does that make pecan pie a liquid? or banana cream pie a liquid. Uh, I'm waiting for a determination now from the TSA on that, but at least we know that peanut butter is now a no-no, unless it's less than, you know, the little bit of that. And that's not why you're on the plane with that sandwich, which means you can't take the sandwich on the plane. At least you have to buy it at an exorbitant price after you clear security. Anyway, that was that. Now we got some more questions that were sent in. Uh, okay. Uh, do I, Kurt wants to know, do I know travel sites that have deals for seniors? Uh, send me an email, peter at petergreenberg.com. We'll, we'll research that for you, Kurt, because right now it's like getting a senior discount on an airfare. It really doesn't exist the way you think it does because it's usually a discount from their highest published fare, somewhat meaningless. Uh, okay. Can I, Scott wants to know, can I talk about the Frontier Summer All You Can Fly Pass? Yeah. They want to know, is it a good deal? Well, it's a good deal if you have tremendous flexibility in your schedule and you can't plan ahead, right? You're only allowed to book 24 hours before you want to fly. And that also applies to your return flight. So that may input have some, some, some effect on the budget for your hotels and where you're staying if you can't get home, right? Uh, also, Frontier this week just pulled out of 14 cities. So what happens if they pull out after you've got a sick? It's, it's a little, but if you have flexibility, and you have patience, and you're going to fly it a lot, then it's then it's cost effective. All right. Uh, Ellie wants to know why are cruises now so expensive? Well, huh, let's talk about this. A lot of people are cruising now. The other day, the Symphony of the Sea on Royal Caribbean set a record for most number of passengers ever carried on a cruise ship. If you add the passengers and the crew, so the most number of people on a cruise ship, it was over 7,600 people on one ship. Wow. Now, which ship actually holds the record for the most number of people ever carried on it? We have to go back to World War II for that one. 
That was the Queen Mary. Over 16,000 people crammed onto that puppy. Boy, that would be not a fun experience, especially if you were below decks. Woo. But in any case, cruising's back. And uh, on the bigger ships, they're filling it. All right, let's go scroll down just a little more here while we have a little minute here. Uh, all right. Oh, greetings from uh, Bethany Beach. Hello, uh, Harriet and Jim. All right, keep going here. Okay, we've got somebody coming in from Denver. I'm going to scroll further down here so I don't miss anybody. It's coming up. Hopefully, a lot of people are here today. Oh, Camilla says, but with all separate one-way tickets, you, you lost interline benefits, so no need to build in many more. Oh, wait, interline benefits? How many airlines have canceled their interline benefits so you can't check your bags on different airlines, right? The key here is not to get killed on the fare, right? If you want to check in bags these days, you know, they're going to charge you anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, why is it that flights with more than one layover cost more? Who books these flights? Well, it's how you book the layover flights. You know, there's a way to book tickets where if you want to, let's say you want to go from New York to, actually, Los Angeles to New York or New York to L.A. I'll give you that example. And you book the last flight of the day with a stop in Chicago then the good news is you get to spend a night in Chicago and see your friends, continue on the next day on the very first flight out and not have to pay extra. There are different hacks you can do, right? Now, there's also such, such a thing called trip stacking. And trip stacking is coming back into, into, into favor because of what I just talked about, about the changes in fares. And not only that, every plane being full. Airlines are flying fewer planes, bigger planes, in the more concentrated time periods, which is why the airports seem more crowded than they should be at that particular time. Uh, so what I do is, especially remember these 35 and 40 minute connect times, which are absurd. If I'm on, if I've booked one of those flights, what do I do? I book a second flight on another airline that is a longer layover on the same routes. And I book that as a refundable fare. So if I miss the first flight where it's too late and it, and it can't connect, right? Then the airlines responsible for helping me out on that if they can. Most of the times they can't because they, their other connecting flights are full. But at least I'm protected on the other airline. And one way or the other, I'm going to get a refund on one of those tickets. So you're, you're investing twice to get one back. But at least you're going to get to where you want to go. All right. Uh, okay. Mary says peanut butter is the same consistency as plastic explosive. You may be right. But if that's the case... Uh, we have to have better technology in sniffer machines, which we're getting, by the way, in the United Kingdom to take care of that problem. I'm all in favor of security. Don't get me wrong. But I'm also all in favor of common sense. Uh, okay. All right. Michelle says, my sons and I will be traveling to Istanbul and Cappadocia in May. Very excited. Me too. We love Istanbul. We love Cappadocia. We love supporting Turkey right now in their moment of need after suffering those devastating earthquakes, Istanbul and Cappadocia are both open. Please go and have a great time. You will. And get up very, very early in the morning and get yourself a balloon flight over Cappadocia. It's well worth it. Okay. And, uh, oh, I see what Camilla is saying about interline. Yeah, we just talked about that. Uh, one more thing, guys. And for the month of April, you know, today is Friday. We're coming to you because I had to fly yesterday. But starting in April, we're going to be every Wednesday at noon all across America from a surprise destination every single week. Wednesday noon Eastern time. That's right. All across America. I hope you'll tune in. In the meantime, of course, our radio show tomorrow. I hope you'll check that out. Of course, Hidden Ireland on the air right now. Coming up next month in just a few days, Hidden Aegean. And of course, if you missed it, we also have Hidden Canary Islands and Hidden Saudi Arabia, available on Amazon Prime and Apple TV+. Plus. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, for those of you going to the Taylor Swift concert, be sure to tell me how you enjoyed it and how much you paid, <laughs> and I'll see you next week.